Favor, why is Gaiden? Uh, I don't know. Touching some grass or whatever. That he'll be back in a field. Touching grass, you say? This gives me an idea for a theme. Yes, a very special idea. Is it grass? Uh, what? The theme, is it grass? M no, maybe. Yes, yes. Yes, it is fine. That's it. That's grass. That's the theme. You need to st stop getting this lost in the weeds, Rana. Huh. Well, can't have that, so welcome to Music Arcade. Wait, what? Hello, everyone, for this very grass-scented episode of Music Arcade. I'm Ronico. And I'm Eddie, and I'm super effective against water types. <laughs> fair one, fair one. Uh, so, as... Uh, Suggested during the intro, Galen is currently uh, uh, figuratively touching some grass. Actually, he's in the middle of the Nevada desert. Yeah, so... he, he, he's in Vegas, and if we were to do uh, a theme that was inspired by Vegas, this wouldn't be a PG-13 podcast anymore. Well, I mean, there are some pretty sick uh, casino uh, adjacent themes uh, in video games, but that's not what we're talking about because we came with the grass ID first, and that's what stuck. Pretty much. It was basically a, an evolution of elemental ideas of our conversation. Yeah, exactly. For Because I wanted a, a broader theme that's open but doesn't give much in the way of oh, I wish I could have talked about that, and... If there's any regrets, we'll address those in the next episode. Well, speaking of things that start unmentioned but are going to get mentioned anyway, I do have, before we get into our actual picks, a couple of honorable mentions, so to speak. Uh, you go one, on. Yep. Yeah. One is that uh, I really wanted to get a grounded track in, uh, grounded being that. Uh, Microsoft published survival crafting game, except you're like one millimeter tall and in your back backyard, and you are amidst blades of grass that are tall as trees. Yeah, it's which basically is... the uh, Honey I Shrunk the Kids unofficial game, right? Exactly. Uh, the problem is that the soundtrack favors way more the sci-fi aspect of it than the grassy aspects of it, so I didn't feel it was appropriate for the theme. But I thought it deserved mention anyway. And uh, the other thing I must mention is that if we're going to talk about some forms of veg vegetation and grass, naturally you want to talk about weed as well. And I'm not personally a consumer. I don't think, Eddie, you are that much. And if you are, that's your business, honestly. <laughs> But, I uh, think my asthmatic lungs would kill me if I tried. Right, those! Okay, then. Uh, but anyway, I... This isn't really the vibe we're going for here. Uh, if you uh, enjoy these, uh, all more power to you, but I don't believe any of us has the expertise to really provide valuable insights in that aspects of the vegetation, so we don't have that much of an opinion there, but if I had to make a pick, I would pick Mamego's Garage, but maybe that's extremely uninformed and there are a lot of better choices out there. Mamego's Garage from Beyond Good and Evil. I have no idea what I would pick for that theme, because the only thing that's playing in my mind right now is because I got high. Fair, which is not in any video game that I know of, so... Exactly. And for my part, as far as picks that didn't make it into the episode, uh, I really, really just instantly thought of the Eversong Woods theme from uh, Warcraft, the Burning Crusade expansion, but yeah. we've already talked about that in the past, because I yeah. love that song. So, yeah, go, and that's go something back and on. 
Uh, yeah, and that's something that will come back a couple of times. There is a bit of a crossover between grass themes and wood themes. Who knew? Now on that, let's start with our first uh, actual pick for this episode, uh, which is probably one of the most memorable uh, planes uh, in uh, video games, which is the Ocarina of Time Hyrule Field. Yes, I think pretty much everyone who considers them themselves either a gamer or just a fan of games still knows this song because the N64 is an old, uh, that old that it's not part of the zeitgeist anymore. Everyone is aware of those games. Yeah, exactly. It left a memory, it codified a lot of stuff, and uh, uh, the Hyrule Field itself is just this memorable set piece because compared to the sequence before, it looks so big and uh, you are so very small, so it works very much in, in uh, contrast uh, to uh, emphasize the thing planes have the most of, which is space and openness, and the music reflects that, although the most noteworthy aspect of it starts right at the hook with this almost cuckoo-like alarm bell. Yeah, I I mostly know the song from uh, Speedruns, to be honest, because I'm not a huge Zelda guy. Again, mm -hmm. As per previous episodes, the last time I owned a Nintendo console was a Super Nintendo. Um, but uh, I, I didn't quite remember, at least, the second half of this song. Uh, I guess speedrunners just go by so fast that you don't really hear that, that part. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it, it gets very ominous for a bit. Yeah, because... It's a game with a real-time day-night cycle that's set to five minutes, the song being a little bit above five minutes. So at the later it goes, the closer the tone comes with its more dangerous monsters, and so they have the track that's uh, calibrated in order to reflect that encroaching danger. So I'm gonna go on a limb here and guess that the cuckoo intro plays in early in the morning and the exactly. ominous part plays when it gets dark. Very much so. That's an interesting way of going about yeah, it. Yeah, like it's all the song itself is almost a measure of time, which is very cool. It's also uh, very interesting because this, I believe that Nintendo 64 didn't have the capabilities for. Uh, dynamic uh, music that, like, let's say, compared to Skyrim, which has like ten different ambience tracks, and they just play whichever fits the area and the time of yeah. day best. Uh, I believe the Nintendo 64 didn't quite have the capability for that. So having a single track that plays the entire day, but is timed to play specific uh, sections at specific points in time. That that's a fascinating look into the the past of gaming as well. Yeah, exactly. They're finding ways to make do, and clearly they did a few things right. Given again how much this mostly plain field leaves an impression, I f I believe an impression it took them until Breath of the Wild to recapture. Yeah, I think th this is up there among the most uh, iconic Zelda tracks. Uh, obviously, I would say the most iconic is the Overworld track from the first one. But this is also instantly recognizable and, of course, yeah. very pleasant. Exactly. And this pleasantness, I feel, is a nice way to tie back into the theme of this episode because it's ultimately... Relatively welcoming. There is that looming danger in the end, of course, but planes have this reassuring openness. You see things coming, you know what to expect, and you're free to roam around and uh, to uh, follow the path you want. Versus this 
subtone almost of the sensation of freedom the track convey. I'd say uh, it also has a sense of playfulness, not not as much as some other tracks we'll bring up later. Yes, but uh, it, it has a, a sense of playfulness that fits how at the start of the game you are playing as the kid version of Link. Exactly, just rolling around and. Uh... Yeah, enjoying the wilds. Rolling around and bomb skipping if you're a speed runner. Of course. But yeah, it, it's an icon for a reason. Like, there's. It, it, it's such a part of the zeitgeist that it's hard to even think of things to talk about regarding the song, to be honest. True enough, but I think we've covered a fair bit, so. Let's move on to the next, which is a Nintendo game that you picked. Yeah, so uh, remember when I said the last time I owned a Nintendo system where was the Super Nintendo? Well, I lied. I had a Game Boy Color. I can't believe you did that. Oh, well. Uh, so yeah, uh, Pokemon Gold, Silver, Crystal, Azalea Town. Like, as soon as I first got into Azalea Town on my first playthrough, the theme for the the town just got stuck in my brain and has been living rent-free for the last 20 years. It's incredibly comfy. It is. And really catchy. And then I, I found this cover by uh, a guy going by Classic Meal online, uh, yeah. which is uh, an acoustic guitar cover. It's in our playlist. Please do check out the uh, episode description. And, yeah, uh, and the acoustic guitar adds... Uh, even more to the earthy tone of the track. Yeah, it, it has some very strong folky vibes. Like, uh, I, I can picture someone just, I don't know, sitting in the front porch of their ho- their their house, looking at a grassy field and playing their acoustic guitar. It's a, it's a very homey vibe, let's say. Very much so. Very much so. In the uh... I think that ties into something uh, that's common in Grass Freeman, but that I'm going to explore further with the next track, which is how a lot of it feels like the starter town, you know? It's the starting point of an adventure. You get into wilder things, but if you still have the training wheels, chances are there's some grass around there to soften any fall there is. I, I think that that's generally generally true though uh in, in in this case in particular the almost the entire game in the, the second generation of pokemon games is very uh earthy let's say it, yeah i mean you find pokemon in tall grass it, it, not only that but like uh generation 2 in particular has a strong uh, theme of uh, tradition versus uh, technology, right? Exactly. So uh, you visit a lot of ancient temples and cities that have been there for ages. Yeah. And, uh, there's a lot of these earthy themes. And Azalea Town is uh, one of the first few places you can visit, and it's surrounded by woods. Uh, and it's. It might be the earthiest of the already very earthy themes in uh, Gen 2. Yeah, because it's really nested amidst nature. Yeah, and I genuinely uh, that's a word, uh, prefer (laughs) hearing these songs either in covers like this, with just an acoustic guitar, or the original uh, 8-bit version of the Game Boy Color, than the remakes on the DS. Are good Although the remakes, remakes are very good. They are amazing remakes. I just think that the uh, sound font they use kind of loses a bit of this uh, traditional folky vibe that some of, the, some of these songs have. Yeah, fair. I can say that. In fact, the uh, Heart Goes to Silver version of uh, Azalea Town was the first one I thought of bringing up. But when I stopped to listen to it, I just thought of a mall. Or just... Yeah. A supermarket and that song playing in the background it, it wasn't the same vibe yeah yeah i i can imagine that 
But uh, yeah, something more traditional, more low key, low to the ground, if you will. Yeah, and very if it very calm as well. It it plays into sort of the the vibe of uh, having an open grassy park, even though this isn't a thing for the national park. Uh, it it it, it like brings also that vibe of uh, a a lazy summer day at the at the at the the park. Yeah, which... exactly. Like. This is the opposite of a panic track. Yeah, and uh, we'll get more of that vibe later in this episode as well. Indeed. We are doing all the foreshadowing today. <laughs> well, how about we move on to the next track I mentioned earlier then? This one literally has Earth on the title, so talk about Earth here, I guess. Yeah, and it's the Plains of Passage. Strike the Earth, Plains of Passage. From Shovel Knight. And uh, yeah, I brought this track in particular because it's probably the least grassy I brought up uh, on a purely musical level, but uh, it's more about the associated qualities, and in particular, the uh, first level or tutorial level almost uh, nature of a lot of grassy environments and plains in particular, which I feel is very well represented by this track, in contrast to the more comfy nature of it. This one is a call to adventure. Yeah, I, I was going to say, this is probably the least grassy, quote-unquote, song in, uh, in our yeah, episode it, today. Yeah, it's more about what comes with it. It yeah. deals with the baggage. It's definitely not a, a a bad song for the record. It's it's a really solid uh melody. Oh yeah. Uh, like it's catchy, it drives you forward, uh it's uh, got that heroic feel to it and uh, this deliberately cultivated retro vibe because it's shovel nights and that's what it does very, very well. You can 100% hear the fact that this game is heavily inspired by Mega Man just from this track alone. Oh yeah, uh, the Mega Man and Castlevania and even early Mario's, uh, it's all there. Uh, a little bit, I, I'd say Mega Man a bit, it comes off a bit stronger because of the energy here. Uh, it's sort of a, an action uh, hero uh, energy like Mega Man, while yeah, Ca yeah. Castlevania draws a bit more from like Hard rock and horror, and Mario is more uh, energetic, but like, but uh, sort of lightweight. Let's say. Okay, and uh, maybe as close then to a Ninja Gaiden then. Maybe that was too many then, but yes. Yeah, like Ninja Gaiden, Mega Man, somewhere in that line. Yes, exactly. Uh, honestly, all else I can say here is that I I would love to uh, listen to a, a live instrument arrangement of this. Is this no, melody... I'm sure there's plenty of those. I'm sure there are. But yeah, uh, yeah the, the melody here, it, it's already very uh, very cool to hear in 8-bit, uh, uh, an 8-bit sound font. I would love to hear it uh, with full live instrumentation. It probably sounds amazing. Because uh, it's not a, a, an overly simplistic melody. Uh, a lot of composers, when trying to copy the 8-bit style, end up with something that is yeah that is slow. extremely bleep bloop yeah if that makes uh, any sense uh, overly simplistic yeah like, but it, this one is if it feels rich it feels like you can rearrange it it feels like the track you like that's been remixed for uh 20 years yeah it's like uh if, if you go back to it li and listen to say Mega Man one soundtrack this is how you remember the Mega Man 1 soundtrack sounding like when you were younger. Yeah, yeah, and that's this game's brand, pretty much. They just did an amazing job. What else can we say? Indeed. But yeah, I just wanted to really drive forward that appeal of that call to adventure, the start level vibe. And uh, this just conveys it so nicely, along with this whole nostalgia vibe. But I definitely see that 
using the original, it feels less grassy because the sound font used uh, means there isn't this natural tone that one might not naturally associate with grass. Yeah, I, I, I can, I can get that. Uh, it, it isn't something that like grass wouldn't be the first. Uh, thought that would come to my mind upon listening to this, but I, I can definitely get the, uh, uh, let's say, the artistic interpretation uh, yeah. from it. it. It is there. It is there. Indeed. Now then, let's move on to the next track. What do you have for us? Yeah, uh, let's go with something that is definitely very grassy. Uh, Forest of Fairy Tales from Divinity mm. Original Sin. But did you just bring a forest track to a grass episode? There's grass in the forest. There's a lot of grass in the forest. Touché. But it, honestly, this one, despite being called Forest of Fairy Tales, makes me think more of like a, a clearing in the forest where I see the god Pan dancing around. Yeah, like... I'm not going to be quite as poetic, but uh, it almost has some uh, uh, vibes from uh, Secrets of Mana track I almost picked, uh, which is also in an early game forest. And in the end, I cut it because what I wanted to cover with that track was mostly covered with this one plus a few previous ones. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I am not where this plays in the game because I haven't played the first original Sin game in many years at this point. Fair. Plus I have an issue with these RPG games that are focused on role playing where I create a lot of different characters to see everything the game can do and I just end up never finishing the actual game. Yep. So there's also a big chance I just didn't reach the point where this song plays and that's why I don't remember it. But uh, I definitely have listened to the song a lot because I will shoot for Kirill Pokrovsky until the last of my days. That you will, my friend. But to good reason. Like, I love the choice of instrument for this one in particular. Yeah, I, th I think what I love the most on this, on this one is how it sounds like a folk song. And why it does bring to me specifically to my mind, the brings the image of a Greek god that is Pan. The song itself doesn't really point to a specific culture. There's, of course, heavy influence from Slavic folk, but it's not 100% Slavic folk. It is yeah. the folk of a fictional fantasy world. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there's this, uh, this flues in particular, of course, that drives things forward, but Overall, the song remains low-key enough that it doesn't go fully into like a festival theme that would be more urban in nature. Yeah, like it, it is still festive, but it's more of a, a, a small party in a, a, a clearing or in a field. It's yeah. not a formal event, let's say. Exactly. It's got that fable vibe to it, almost. Yeah, I I can see that. I can I can definitely see that. It, it honestly it really makes you feel like uh, if you are just really just listening to the song, it really gives you the the vibe that you are listening to uh, something from a fairy tale, as the name says. Yeah. That name certainly is pretty straightforward. Forest of Fairy Tales, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, checks out. Yep. And uh, that is uh, not the only uh, song we have from uh, a Western game set in a fantasy world with a very straightforward title, is it? Well, no it isn't, because uh, we have from Heroes of Might and Magic 4 the Grasslands theme. I wonder I, where it plays. I think it may have another name. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I tried um, looking uh, in at the uh, soundtrack on VGMDB. That's the video I game music database. I was going to do just that, actually. One moment. It, it is probably the Terrain Dash Grass song from the uh, soundtrack available on the GOG version of the game. Uh, the actual original Correct. soundtrack for the original release has no song with the same title. We might end up doing some post-recording research uh, to make sure there is not a secondary title for the song. If there is, there is because there are on VGMDB two soundtracks: I, Heroes of Might and Magic Four Complete, which has the two brains dash grass uh, type titles. And uh, Heroes of Might and Magic 4 of the soundtrack, which has uh, more normal names, except for the battle themes. Yeah, uh, we'll probably end up checking out to make sure whether this song was only in the second soundtrack. And if it was in the first, what was the title? Uh, you guys listening will see that in the episode description. We will give full credit and details as we always do. Uh, indeed. Uh, but as for the song itself, uh, again, incredibly folksy, uh, like, they whip out the bagpipes, that's how much there is. It, it's very interesting how uh, the song sort of has, I, I guess I'd describe it as three or four uh, distinct movements. Yes. And the, the transitions are very smooth, very seamless. Yeah, uh, like you, you can definitely see the changes, but it doesn't feel abrupt. It feels almost like a panning camera that moves from one part of the planes to the next. Yeah, um, I, I would like to note my, my first two impressions when listening to this, uh, while I, I was still listening to the, let's call it the first movement of the song. Mm-hmm. The, the first one was, of course, as we talked before the recording, I cannot believe this isn't a, my pick. <laughs> um, th- this is the sort of stuff I, I really love. Uh, and the second thing I thought of during the first part of, the, of this theme is, this is like the England ambient music from Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but actually good. Whoa. I might have been Pavloved into thinking that because it's also a Ubisoft title, but still, it has that vibe of medieval England, but it's actually interesting to listen to. Yeah, it has very much that medieval England vibe, and then some, because the grasslands are the uh, privileged terrain of multiple factions, and uh, I feel they really reflect those multitudes in that theme. It's diverse, and uh, one of the probably more notable things is that for terrain themes, they keep the same notes uh, throughout the terrains. Like, whether you're on grass, or snow, or dirt, etc., you're still going to hear some dun 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 etc. going on. And thus, they differentiate that with the choice of instruments. And so, again, we have for this one the choice of this acoustic guitar, where you can hear the strings uh, that are rubbed before they're played, and this very um, kind of natural tone, very manual, very DIY almost. I do want to shout out, though, uh, around the last quarter of the song or or so, there's just someone on an acoustic guitar just shredding there. (laughs) And it sounds awesome. Oh, yeah. Like... You don't usually think acoustic guitar when you think shredding, but oh man. And also you think that the the transition from a generally more calm song into that shredding acoustic guitar would be sort of like pure whiplash, but it works. 
Yeah, because it keeps itself busy because, again, we have this part where it's not just medieval England, it's also, like, the fairylands, and uh, it plays into how much it goes from one to the other because it's contested territories, in a way. And uh, this soundtrack certainly isn't afraid at times to uh, ramp up the speed and get intense. Uh, I highly recommend the Coast theme, uh, the Coast Tone theme of all things, uh, for something that absolutely does not need to go anywhere near that hard, but decides to go full ham anyway. I shall take you on that and listen to that later, because it sounds interesting. Excellent. Then, from one excellent advice to the next, let's move on to a game that comes highly recommended by you, and I fully believe that, and I still haven't gotten around to it, but I definitely will at some point. Take us there. God, this DLC is hard as balls, so... uh. This is a song from the Lemurian Vampire DLC for The Case of the Golden Idol. This is uh, the Vampire Strike Morning variation. Because uh, in this DLC you can see uh, the same area at multiple times in a day. Nah. So, uh, yeah, this I believe this is for the second case of the DLC. The DLC has three cases for you to solve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this being the theme for the second one. And uh, I've I've compared this fairly recently. I think it was December of last year. I compared mm-hmm. the DLC soundtracks to the Dead Can Dance music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'll just read my notes verbatim here real quick. Um. The Dead Can Dance called, and they want their mix of electric guitars with neo folk music back. Oh, maybe, given that a vampire is reportedly involved, we could call that the Undead Can Dance. But yeah, it, it, it has that uh, mix of uh, sort of gothic rock-esque guitars with neo It's very mystical, it's very intriguing. Yeah, it's it definitely has that sense of foreboding that you want in a detective game, yeah. uh, which m- kind of makes it feel, in this case, like you're in a, a very dark uh, jungle and you don't know what's around the corner, which is a bit ironic because the jungle for this one is kind of small because it's a small island. You mean you put a jungle theme in a grass episode? There's, uh, <laughs> there's plenty of grass in the jungle. I can't attest to that because I live near a lot of jungle in Brazil. This is even funnier when you know what pink comes next. Yeah, pretty much. Um, anyone listening, you, you'll get it in a few seconds, just wait. But uh, yeah, the the, uh, the Vampire Strikes morning, uh, it I, I'd say of the variations on the song, the others are a bit more ominous because, you know, either the vampire has Truck, or it's straight up just darker around the environment. Yeah. This one is early in the day, so it still has more of the the jungle vibe. Mm-hmm. Before I the guitar love, kicks in. love, 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 love the percussions in this one. Oh yeah, like uh, I I do want to incidentally, as we're talking, shout out that the composer has this on uh, his personal band camp. So if you want to support a, a composer directly, do buy it from him. Uh, yep. But yeah, this this man has done some amazing work. Uh, I'd say, like, uh, I often talk about this, and I've mentioned this previously uh, in this episode, how uh, Kirill Pokorovsky had uh, this solid ability to create music that feels like true folk music from an actual uh, folklore, but from... Uh, uh, a fictional world, not a, the yeah, real yeah. one. Uh, this song isn't quite there because the electric guitar makes it feel more modern and less folky. But generally speaking, this composer 
kind of does something similar to that vibe. Uh, of course, it has always some sort of uh, ominous element that makes it diverge a little bit from that fo fully folky vibe because it is a detective game. But uh, you, you can kind of, while listening to songs like this one, you can kind of imagine like this this son of a bitch biker on, on my window. <laughs> you can kind of imagine this this folky uh, I said the, the, this folklore this uh this culture folklore. you're investigating. Yeah, you 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 can imagine you can picture the uh the culture coming through in the form of music just being slightly cut by the ominous undertone of let's say the electric guitar here. It, it like been... a field of grass slightly trampled by somebody suspect. Say a vampire. Sure. But yeah, this uh, th this soundtrack, uh, I, I really love it. I Dead Can Dance is among one of my favorite acts of music of all time, and the fact that this work makes me think of them is high praise from from me, to be honest. And well deserved. Yeah, and I I love me some 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 guitars like that. Uh, the, the the deeper tones on the electric guitar are something that I I really really enjoy and that is why I'm always very attracted to goth rock because goth rock tends to use that a lot and it sounds incredible here it uh, it doesn't destroy the vibe of of the the folky jungle vibes it just adds an element of suspicion and ominousness to it. Which Absolutely, it is kind of hard to do. It, it's not always you can mix those two ideas together and not ha have one of them be undermined by the other. Indeed. Then again, when I think of grass and suspense mixing together, I think of say somebody sneaking in the tall grass hiding from an enemy I stay infiltrate a novelly large complex and I think of a Metal Gear Solid Free Snake Eater. Did you just bring a jungle to this grass themed episode? Oh no, the Uno reverse card! Ugh! Yeah, you activated my trap card. And, <laughs> and ironically, that's also a bit of a, a foreshadowing, but not for the main episode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Snake but yeah, was, I think, I, th this was, I think, the second ever Metal Gear game I've played and the first Metal Gear Solid game I've played. So uh, I have strong memories of this. Yeah, and this game is mostly remembered musically for its main menu theme, which is incredible, of course, but the rest of the uh, game has some very strong part, and this one feels like a broader main theme for the game, but the the theme that captures the vibe of it all, of what it means to actually play it, of calculating your approach, staying hidden, and preparing the moment where you're going to strike like the snake you're named after. I would say it is also a very cinematic song in True Kojima yeah. fashion. Uh, I, I think everyone knows at this point, and Kojima has pretty much said as much on in, on interviews, that he's basically a frustrated uh, film director who entered into game devel development. Um, so this is very cinematic in true Kojima fashion, but it also oh, absolutely. does give those strong, I'm stuck in a jungle and anything here can kill me vibes. Yeah, exactly. Like... The terrain for this one is your ally, and you kind of need to blend with it. Thus, the camouflage system in the game. Yeah, it's, and, it's like uh, uh, the terrain is an enemy and an ally at the same time. Like it, exactly. It is your main tool 
because you are uh, trying to use the grass and the trees to your advantage with the camo system. But at the same time, so are the snakes that can bite and poison you. Indeed. Or anybody we, that's right behind a dead angle and you can't quite see them. And when you're going after somebody, somebody else was watching. And suddenly everything is falling into pieces. I have a feeling you're speaking from experience there. I certainly am. But I think that's only the second best grass theme in the game because the strongest memories I've made sneaking and crawling in tall grass in that game, including during a boss battle, was without music because you both want that clarity to be able to follow the sound cues and uh, it just is a nice and frankly economical way to uh, reflect the tension. Like, the fight against the end wouldn't have that weight if it had an epic swelling music along with it. Yeah, I, I think uh, a, good, uh, a good way to illustrate that, that vibe is by comparing it to the Hitman games. Uh, I, I'm yeah. not sure we've talked about it too much in the podcast itself. Uh, I definitely know we've joked about it off the podcast about how uh, Hitman is actually a puzzle game disguised as a, a stealth game. Oh, it absolutely is. Yeah, you can easily like follow the, the NPCs, you can see uh, the entire map, you can see which disguises get you where and all that stuff. Uh, so you have a lot of time and a lot of space to see things and play with the, the puzzle while trying to to solve it uh metal gear at least for this entry not every entry in the metal gear game uh franchise is fully a stealth game but this is one of the the hard more hard stealth entries in the franchise and yeah. in games like this they are very uh th th there's a huge snowball effect if you try to to uh experiment too much you either get things done right or you fail. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, uh, I thought where you were going with that Hitman parallel was uh, again in regards to silence and how in Hitman you start without much in the way of music unless it's diegetic until you've accomplished your task, at which point you have a music as you make for the exit. Because at this point, the concentration can be afforded to uh, be let go a little. Yeah, there, there's definitely that a little bit. But also, um, in Hitman, you, you do have a lot of diegetic music, usually. Like, taking the... Uh, World of Assassination Trilogy, for example, one of the very first maps has you in a fashion show with very yeah. loud music. Uh, in a more hardcore... And again, it, in, in, it can in, be used uh, as sound cues to camouflage some of your actions. It can, but at the same time, in a more hardcore stealth game like this, or like the Splinter Cell franchise, for example, you want more silence because you want to be able to hear the footsteps of guards. Because exactly. you do not have the instinct mechanic that the Hitman, the recent Hitman games have. Yeah, and unlike the previous two Metal Gear Solid games, you don't even have a Soliton radar. Yeah, this is this is definitely a game that uh, plays up the stealth. Uh, like I yeah. said, not every game in the franchise does this. Metal Gear sometimes is very bombastic, just Look at look oh, at Metal Gear including Rising, including in this game. Yeah, and I mean, just look at Metal Gear Rising, like yeah, but that's, that's a special the, case. That's in the same franchise and still fits the the world, so you can see how there's room to be bombastic. But yeah, but but the, the uh, when it comes looks. to sneaking for this one, it feels right at home there in the mud on the grass. Yeah, it's it's the core gameplay loop of this game, outside of the bosses and. Songs like this are pretty much the only ones that can kind of fit what you're doing. 
I would say. Yeah. Though you do want more silence usually, which is a shame okay. because the music is good. Oh yeah, no doubt, but sometimes you have to know about restraint to make things work. Yeah, as a final a final note from me on the song as well, uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 is known for being sort of the the big spy thriller of the franchise because it's set during the Cold War and your enemy is the Soviet Union. Um, it has a, a lot of inspiration from the 007 movies down to the yeah. Snake Eater theme being very Bond-esque of a theme song. With some Rambo thrown in there. Yes. Uh, so this song, it probably wouldn't surprise anyone that around the second half of the song, the strings kick in and you get a very strong spy thriller vibe from the strings. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of wouldn't, wouldn't have been Metal Gear Solid 3 without those. It is still tactical espionage action. Yeah, the, the word action is there for a reason. And the word espionage. Yep. And uh, the word tactical too, if you're a better player than me. <laughs> and if not, you can always play the Ape Escape minigame and have a good time anyway. You know, I never played that one actually. He tried and was terrible at it. So, moving on from that old shame, uh, how about we talk about some Quinted Game? So, remember when I said earlier that the theme of a song that feels like a lazy day at a park would come back? Well, it's back. Evergreen from Terra Enigma. And uh, it is. It gives off very strong lazy summer day at a park vibes to me. Especially the cover that is in the playlist for this episode. Yeah, but at the same time, you've kind of earned that day given what you do in the game and that you make those grasslands happen from nothing yeah uh, i think it's worth giving a, a quick look on how how this game plays because terra enigma isn't a very well-known game so uh, until the final act of the game the first i think three or four acts are focused on basically the idea that you resurrect part of the world and then you go there destroy the demons that are infesting the place and return it to the natural state of things and I think some of the demons actually once you defeat them their soul returns to the natural world while they become one of the characters yeah. in the safe hub yeah I think that happens that is sort of a, a running element in the unofficial quintet trilogy that is a uh, yeah, Soul Blazer, Illusion of Gaia, and Terra Enigma. So I believe there's that here as well. Um, but yeah, this in, in this case, what uh, for this song to play, what you've just done is you've returned Flora to the world, and you've destroyed a demon that was infecting that Flora and stopping it from growing. And so once you defeat that boss, you are putting a Sort of a glade in the middle of a forest, and this You've song is playing. That grass. You have earned that grass, and that sounds like we are smoking weed. But uh, yeah, it is definitely a, a very, a very vibey song of. Let's calm down. Vibey and vibrant, in fact. Hey, oh, not wrong. No, but really, it has this. A very vivid aspect to it. It does. Uh, the, honestly, this soundtrack in general is one that a lot of people sleep on, in my opinion. And I mean, the fact the game didn't come natively to the West uh, probably didn't help. Yeah, I, it got released in Europe, if memory serves me well, but it was a limited release. And it didn't go to the US. I believe the theory is because of the themes of the game, because religion and alcohol are kind of a big deal when you get to the third act where you're dealing with uh, humankind and growing human technology, evolving human technology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and the 
it, it is well documented that Nintendo of America didn't like having those things in their games because they thought their the their system was just for kids and Terra Enigma was an SN, SNES game. But uh yeah, it's it's a game that uh to to share something that I shared with Rana just before recording, I shared the opinion of Yuzo Koshiro, who says this is another Quintet game, just like Act Razor, that deserves a remake. No, it definitely does. Like that uh, that uh, loose trilogy uh, is uh, is the source of many uh, good memories and definitely deserves a bit more of a spot than uh, it had due to the disbanding studio. Yeah, it, it, and I uh, hope something will be figured out eventually because they're wonderful little games, all three of them, very different from each other too. Yeah, I think it's also very interesting how they were uh, among the very few hack and slash action RPGs on the SNES. Like, I can mostly just think of them and the Secret of Mana franchise. Hmm, I mean. There weren't very many. A link to the past. I mean, fair, but that one isn't very RPG. If that makes any sense. It's more of a top-down action yeah. adventure. It was a very. But yeah, like the the closest point of comparison for uh, this one I can think of is uh, on the Mega Drive or Genesis for those that uh, uh, that uh, call it that. Uh, where Lance Stalker comes to mind. Ironically, for Brazilian, I'm not very familiar with the Genesis, so that reference is lost on me. Damn, good game. Uh, I believe you. I, f- I think it's on the Switch uh, on Nation, but that doesn't matter. We get in too far. But yeah, the Terra Enigma it's, a, it's an amazing game, and uh, if Square Enix does remake it like they did with Razor, which is another Quintet game, uh, even if it's just limited to, let's say, the Switch, because it was originally limited to the SNES, I would be very hard-pressed to buy a Switch, because Terra Enigma is yeah. one of my favorite games. It's nice. And this song being so feel good uh, helps invoke uh, that nostalgia for it too it, that was probably not intentional it wasn't i just honestly i just thought terra negra probably has something and then i found this it cover did. and this cover honestly it's it's awesome um the, the original version of the evergreen theme at one point it has a, a key change which i am not really fond of in the sound font on the SNES and I'm mm-hmm. also not very fond of it on a lot of covers because it kind of comes off as not uh, a deliberate key change but rather someone hitting the wrong notes on accident for a little bit uh, Yeah, but this cover gets around that very well and it's also just a, a very very well produced and well thought out uh, arrangement uh, it's a shame that I have to say that the cover is by one going by the name Yuck Pover, because that is the name they use online. Which is a weird name. A choice. It, it is. I'm sure it has an interesting story. Or not, who knows. Uh, <laughs> all I can tell is that they speak German. So who knows. But, uh, yeah, the, the mix of instruments, the piano, the synth, the acoustic guitar, which makes the return. Uh, it, it all works so well. It gives a very very cozy vibe. Indeed. And now for something that does not give a cozy vibe. Yeah, but does have acoustic guitar. Uh, I am talking about the Feel the Fate stage theme. Namely, the Street Fighter V version, of which it is a remix of uh, Street Fighter Alpha 2 uh, arcade version uh, of uh, the stage, which 
came because I was just wondering about any iconic plains and grass fields and this one pretty quickly came to mind. I think even before the Hyrule Plains because like there's grass that's there because it's the default and then there's this one which spells grass in big bold letters, you know? It's like we only just going to have grass on the skies but we are going to animate the bleep out of those. Man, I, I just love the guitar and the flutes on this thing. Yeah, I think one of the great conclusions for this episode as a whole, exemplified by this one, is that grass and acoustic guitars go hand in hand. As do grass and flutes, honestly. Uh, we haven't... Yeah. We, we didn't have that many flutes uh, on this episode. I think it was mostly this and Heroes of Might and Magic in the end. But, and uh, uh, Metal Divinity. Gear. And Metal Gear. Metal Gear has flutes in the second half. So yeah, a few flutes. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I guess those are kind of the, the key elements to get a, a grassy vibe. But exactly. It, this is... This works better than I would have thought if you told me I have a fighting game song with flutes and an acoustic guitar and it's an, an electronic song. I would have thought this cannot mix well, but it does. Oh, it definitely does. It really works for the tension of uh, the situation because it's a key moment. I chose it because it's iconic, but uh, because it's uh, the uh, place where in the Street Fighter anime Ryu gave get Sagati's car, I believe. And uh, so that's a key moment and its tension is reflected in the music. It's one of the ways it really sticks in your head as well is uh, by the simple fact that it's in free fourth. So it has this hurried feeling to it, which I really like in particular because I didn't want grass theme to just be cozy theme. I wanted something more active and I'm really happy this was there and fit the bill so perfectly. I think it's also uh, interesting to contrast this to the Shovel Knight song, where both of them are very energetic songs in grassy areas, but yeah. this one still has the grassy vibes with it. You can, yeah, like, uh, but... But what it doesn't have was uh, explicitly why I brought the Shovel Knight track uh, 4, which is that it's not a first level song. Instead, oh. it's a conclusion, a destination. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I completely, completely understand the, the choice, and uh, definitely, definitely not fighting against that. But it, it, it's interesting to see that. Uh, uh, these different approaches, because uh, Shovel Knight is more focused on the action and on introducing you to the game, more or less. Exactly, yes. While this one is more focused on making sure the identity of the background sticks in your head in the song yeah, as well. And the tension of it. Yeah, it's, it's one where they definitely were looking more at the stage, as one does for stage themes in fighting games, than they yeah. were... Uh, looking at, uh, say, where the player was at in their journey. Let's, uh, which Exactly, Be because a part of it, especially in the choice of instrumentation, because it's a remix, is that it evokes a bit of that nostalgic feeling because it's a remix of a stage that existed previously a, a fair amount of time ago. So it hits that string of nostalgia with the string of the guitar. Was that on purpose? That was a spur of the moment thing. Hmm. Nicely thought out. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, this, uh, as with the vast majority of Street Fighter themes, this is, this is a bop. Yeah, yeah. It it doesn't go too hard, but it goes enough to uh, justify it uh, being uh, yeah a fighting game song. It's 
it's just it has a way to uh, make it s- itself comfortable in your head and like I live here now. I can see that. There's that is basically what happened with the Azalea Town theme from Pokemon Gold Silver Crystal. It lives yeah, in my head kinda. now. Exactly. The main difference being that one came with fuzzy slippers and the other with, uh, I don't know, boxing gloves, I guess. Did you just say one came with fuzzy slippers? Slippers. Oh, okay. Because now I'm thinking of a fuzzy mind flayer because I've been playing Baldur's Gate. Well, tell us more about that. In Music Arcade, no playing. Yeah, Baldur's Gate, uh, it's uh, taking up a lot of my free time right now. Because I discovered there is a very good build planner online and I have been creating builds a lot and I have 20 characters I've created and oh god, please help me. What did you say your problem with the original scene was again? Something something creating too many characters something something. I see. Yeah, this uh this is the same, same deal. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh I have I think But hey, I I can also see a relation with the track we just talked about when it comes to the choice of interesting time signatures. So smooth. Yep. Yep. There's some very very cool cool music in this game. We've already talked about yeah. that a lot. But uh, yeah, I have like 20 builds saved on the build planner and six characters created in game already. I have a problem. <laughs> Uh, as for another game I've been playing, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duo Links, I, I, I play it on occasion, sort of the the one almost gacha game that I play. Yeah, gacha adjacent for sure. Duo Links is a bit more uh, gacha adjacent than most online card games, I'd say, uh, because it has characters, it has character skills, it's meant to be played a bit more casually. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it doesn't have like banners that you need to pull from to hopefully get your character. You get characters through in-game objectives. But uh, the there was an event recently. It's uh, kind of a bit late now as of the time of this recording because we had to uh, mm-hmm. delay this episode a little bit. But uh, early this year, there was uh, a reprise of the event uh, Tag Team Duel, which... Uh, Tag Team Duo is a, an event that happens every few months or so, uh, where you play alongside uh, um, an AI-controlled uh, ally yeah. in a 2v2 format against two other AI-controlled uh, pl- uh, players. Uh, and for some reason, the Tag Duo event has music that goes so hard. <laughs> Everything else in the game is either very calm and pleasant, or if it's a bit o- more ominous or more, more rock esque, it's just, just because it's trying to get the vibe of the anime series it's representing with the character. Mm-hmm. But in this event, every single time this event comes up, this is I think the third time I I played during a tag team duo event. Every time there's a couple new songs, and they 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 always are some hard rock stuff that goes harder than you would expect from a collectible card game made primarily for mobile devices. Tag team is where the rock is. Got it. Pretty much. Like, (laughs) it is insane how this comes from the same company that is letting Metal Gear and Castlevania die. Uh, the the Yu-Gi-Oh games currently available, Duel Links and uh, Master Duel, they both have some incredible uh, uh, production value in the soundtrack, and that, that's that's great. That's absolutely great. And uh, if you're gonna make good money, might as well make them with good games. Pretty much. And uh, 
Konami is definitely making some good money on Yu-Gi-Oh! Because they just recently, in the Yu-Gi-Oh! 25th anniversary uh, event in Japan, announced that they have a, a full-blown animation studio now. And they announced that by showcasing uh, a full animation of multiple uh, cards from the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. And... Uh, Let's see what comes from that, I guess. Seems like Konami is going all in on Yu-Gi-Oh! right now. Uh, but to uh, round, down, uh, round up my list of, of games that are now playing, this mm -hmm. next one isn't one uh, that I'm actively playing, but it is now playing in my head constantly ever since I saw the Power Pack video on it the other day. And that is Signalis. Uh -huh. And my god. I've good things about this one, but I haven't played it myself. Yeah, it's a survival horror with a top down perspective. It yeah. draws a lot from Silent Hill, uh, Resident Evil. Honestly, I'd say there's a bit of uh, Metal Gear in there as well. Uh, All with a sci fi tinge, of course. Yes. Uh, sci fi. I I'd say, like, the aesthetic is sci-fi. The plot is eldritch horror. Yeah, but it doesn't have like ten it doesn't have tentacles. It doesn't have Cthulhu. It's just that you are a uh, an insignificant part of a world that has things with just huge powers that can manipulate reality like it's nothing. And uh, for the first time since my teenage years, I want to play a survival horror game because I am just so fascinated by this thing. And, Great! And the soundtrack is amazing. It has this mix of songs that are pretty much industrial, as in the genre of industrial mm -hmm, music. Mm -hmm. Very abrasive, very hard on your... or on a, uh, Retake that. Very hard on your ears. And alongside it, it has a couple uh, classical pieces. I think they're technically from the Romantic period, if memory serves me well. Uh, yeah. One of them is Swan Lake. And the other... Wait. Retake one of them is Swan Lake, I'm thinking. <clears throat> one of them is uh, Swan Lake. And the other is Serenade from uh, Franz Schubert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the rest of the soundtrack is basically neoclassical. It sort of takes that uh, Silent Hill idea of uh, safe spots have more ethereal vibe music to them. But it... Yeah, and that ethereal nature, given the weirder part of the game, is definitely intentional and heavy and meaningful. Yeah, yeah, and... Um... I'd say the the main difference there between the uh, the two approaches is that uh, Silent Hill it uh, mostly reaches that vibe with more um, more synth. I'd say like it it goes straight up mm -hmm. ethereal sounds, if, uh, sounds that just would not naturally exist. Yeah. Yeah, good old... yeah, something like that. Um, Signalis does have those sounds, but it mixes those with uh, pianos. Uh, particularly the song that's on the playlist for this episode. Uh, it's in German, Die Toten Insel. Uh, it's, it's one of those songs. It, mm -hmm. it is so good, so pleasant. <laughs> And it's stuck in my head. This one and the song The Promise, which is basically the title theme for the game, yeah. those two are stuck in my head forever. <laughs> I can't believe I want to play a survival horror game. I have anxiety issues. What am I doing? <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's basically my list. All right. On my end, I mostly split my attention between two pretty substantial games. First, during 
what I would call the before times or the waiting period, I played a fair bit of Pearl World as it released, and for once got into the big flavor of the month game. Who'd have known? You're one of the cool guys. Yeah, for once. Incredible. And uh, yeah, it's it's strange because this game is... On the surface, when you look at each individual element, it feels mid. It has no right to be outright good, but at the same time, the way those systems that seem like they would not work together have been made to work together make the game as a whole feel more cohesive and more interesting than it should be on first inspection. Yeah, I, I think I've heard more or less that opinion coming from other other people I know as well, particularly some members of my uh, Destiny clan. Ah. Because uh, they don't play just Destiny, even though it is a Destiny clan. Yeah, of uh, course. So uh, quite a few of them have been playing Power World as well. I, I personally am a bit uh, a bit hesitant because of the talk about using AI. Uh, I believe that, I mean, play, those that uh, play Pearl World are one thing, those that, uh, and then there are those that play another form of Pearl World, which is enjoying Pearl World discourse. I am not one of those players. Oh, don't get me wrong, I don't enjoy those di that discourse as well, and I don't follow it. Yeah, but it is inevitable. Yeah, it's, uh... If you're into video games, you are going to find someone talking about yes. this. Uh, and I do have uh, answers to that, but I don't think that's the best avenue to discuss that. Uh, what I will say, however, is when it comes to the music, it's frustrating. Like, it tries to be uh, a fair bit Zelda Breath of the Wild, and is a worse version of that in parts, but when you listen to, say, the battle theme, it starts kind of like that, and it's trash, but then, I mean, I find it highly un unpleasant, I mean, but then when it goes into the more instrumental part, it's, it would have been a perfect fit for this episode, in fact. It has this cool, wonderless aspect to it. It works as a battle theme in a very open world where things don't need to get intense. And then it alternates between that and the uh, weirdo electronic sound that are just a choice I do not like. Yeah, based on the battle theme you shared, the, the electronic aspect, he was poorly thought out, in my opinion. Yeah, it, f it feels cheaper than it is. Yeah, it, it, it definitely feels like it's one of those games where you play Spotify in the background or leave a YouTube video on your second monitor while you're playing. Yeah, it, yeah exactly. That, that's a shame, because I hear it, it really is like, uh, one of those games that embody the the saying that uh, more than the sum of its parts. Like, yes, it, it, its parts seem like cheap knockoffs of other games like Ark, Survival, whatever, yeah. and Pokemon. Yeah, like it looks like oh, I could I could make that game. Oh, bro, bro, it's an asset flip. Bro, 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 whatever, but you don't get that kind of fun from a thoughtless asset flip. Yeah, it it definitely feels like the from what I've seen of it, the, the game itself is surprisingly solid. It's a shame the there soundtrack is a fair is... bit under the hood. Yes. And the occasional issues of pathfinding and anything that comes with a zero point one point four version of a game. Especially a 0 0.1.4 version of an open world game where you can manipulate the uh, the environment. Exactly. And then uh, I completely dropped this game because uh, 
Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth came out the 25th. We are now the 4th of February. I have 19 hours into this... 90 hours into this game. And we were talking about me and Creeper World last time. I like Infinite Wealth a lot. I'm obviously not going to get a, a lot into it because one, Gelling hasn't played it yet because he's on his trip, and two, uh, we have a podcast just for that. But I will just say that not only is there a fair amount of nice original tracks, they also have reused a couple of songs in such a good way that it gave me pause, just made me stop, lean back and go, yeah, okay, you got me. That sounds fun. Oh yeah. Oh, these, these are moments I'm not going to forget. Yeah, that doesn't, doesn't happen very often. It is yeah. really fun when it does. Exactly. And normally there are only the diegetic ambience of uh, the world around you when you're going uh, your way in the street, but they have discovered the power of having a phone with a playlist that you can play music from. So now you can collect some CDs and have an actual in-game playlist you go and uh, that plays between the battles and that resumes automatically after you did a battle and it just works the way it should. Hooray for games that do that. Do that. Exactly, especially <laughs> since there's a fair amount of uh, nice crossover tracks so you can go along the streets of Honolulu in uh, with playing some uh, Shin Megami Tensei and Devil Survival and uh, Persona Tracks uh, and uh, some other even more obscure games and it's just good fun. It's good. The game is good. I'm very much not tired of it. I'm playing the uh, Animal Crossing like mini game right now and uh, it's it's a good time. I like my time. My many, many, my substantial time I'm spending with that game. I guess we could just say for more information on why you've been playing it for 90 hours, please check our sister podcast, Year of, Year of the Dragon. Yes, or towards the Year of the Dragon level, we will have attained it by the time we come around to... Uh, this episode in particular, since uh, we need Gavin to get back, and by the time we'll record, I think the recording for the next episode will be on the uh, Lunar New Year, and then uh, that won't even be this episode yet, because we still have the man who erased his name, and uh, the Kato files that we'll cover in that episode, and then we'll cover that for the next episode which should be in March, and there'll probably be one in April too, because it's a big game, and we'll have a lot to talk about, and we don't want to get stuck continuously for like 10 hours, although I could, I definitely have the endurance to play the game, I might as well talk about it, but... In other words, anyone listening to this, you guys have time to catch on, catch up on that podcast. Yes, indeed. Um... But when it comes to this podcast, we are drawing to a close. Thank you all very much for watching or listening or however you're enjoying this podcast. Don't forget to check the description for any information regarding how to contact us or the composers and other information related to those tracks and a link to the playlist we have on YouTube in to have a listen to the tracks we are talking about. We are not integrating those directly in the episode to avoid any liability problems and to have the episodes themselves struck when it comes to copyright and those kind of tricky stuff. This is always the case, but it's nice to reassert uh, it sometimes. And on that, uh, we will be leaving you all until next episode. We'll see you next time. I've been Ranakel, you've been Eddie. 
See you next time. See you next time with 50% more hosts. <laughs>